Relay FM. This is Upgrade, episode 505. Today's show is brought to you by Squarespace, Vitally, and Ladder. My name is Mike Hurley, and I'm joined by Jason Snow. Hi, Jason. Hi, Mike. I can't drive 505 because that's too fast. My car doesn't go that fast. Ah, that was a. I was I was lost there. You know, you, I said 505. Sammy you said Hagar. Back to me. I had no idea. Reference there. 505. 505 is, is a name of an interstate uh, yeah. highway in Great. California. Okay. So a little, little 505 trivia for you there. I love it. Thank you. Yes, you did hear the draft music. We are going to be doing a draft did later I? on in today's episode. It is an action-packed oh, episode today. Surprise draft. That surprise includes draft. a surprise draft. We'll get to that yeah. later on in the show. But first... I must ask you a snow talk question. Okay. This one comes from Andy, who wants to know, Jason, will you be getting a Blake Snell jersey since he has just signed with the Giants? Yes, San Francisco Giants signed Blake Snell, the winner of the Cy Young Award, which is for the best pitcher in the National League last year with the Padres. He was a free agent all winter long, and at the very end of the free agency season, signed a one, well, it's a two-year deal with an opt-out, but basically a one-year deal with the Giants. And uh, so for the first time ever, my favorite team, my childhood team, employs a player, a star player, but regardless, a player with my last name. No relation, by the way. No relation. And Andy, the answer is, will I be getting a Blake Snell jersey? I think the entire family will be getting <laughs> Blake Snell jerseys. I'm I think assuming it's like when it's all look, of the merch that could journey. be produced in this one year period, you will be buying it. Yeah, all of personalized it. jersey. You normally have to pay to like yeah. have it be personalized with your name and stuff. I'm not not gonna have to do it. I'm just gonna say, give me the Blake Snell S- number seven. Got it. Boom. Done. And I'll just keep that for like ever. I look forward to the what I'm assuming is going to be like dad joke of every game where you're like approaching the play. It's Snell, and you're like, "Oh, Snell. off I go!" <laughs> ah, well, you we know, one of those. We we saw him pitch in San Diego a couple mm-hmm. years ago, and um, every time, like he would strike somebody out or something, that the scoreboard would have this thing would be like Snell <laughs> and Lauren and I were just laughing and I took pictures of it I took some video of it it's just like it's really nice to have your whole it's like when I went when I was visiting my aunt and uncle when they lived in Florida and we went to a Jacksonville Suns game and their entire um their entire store was just things that were JS and I said I don't know what I'm gonna do here like can I buy it all because mm-hmm. I've, the entire stadium is monogrammed for me. I bought a hat. I have a JS hat. It's great. Pretty good. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a little like that. It's weird. It's weird. In fact, if I wanted a different number other than his number seven that he's going to wear, it would actually cause some cognitive dissonance, right? People would be like, well, why are you wearing a six? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's just all, at least seven. Like uh, People like seven. That's a nice a number. Lucky so number, it's isn't be it? Seven? Lucky Seven, it is, and Jamie was born on a on a oh, seven, so come on. I'll, I'll put I'll put it down that way too. Perfect. So, Andy, yes, the answer is yes, and p- probably much much more. That's the answer. If you would like to send in a question to help us open a future episode of Upgrade, just go to upgradefeedback dot com and send in your Snell talk question. Saddle up, partner. It's time for a rumor roundup. Ooh, yeehaw. Wow, the, the horses got here early today. Very like there's early. other stuff going on in this yeah, episode. there's lots of other stuff. That they, they were scared away from the courthouse, and so here they are. Oh, well, that's well, you got to get them. They shouldn't be there. They should Is it, not did, be were, the they, were they shooed away by like a yes. bailiff? Did a bailiff go, like, get, get out, out of here, here you. you rumor horses? We don't want you And here, they went, so. nay! And he said, uh, yes. Yay. Yay, I think. <laughs> Yay. Right? Yay. And, they, and they left. And they then left. they left, yeah. Mark Gurman in his Power on Newsletter has reported that iOS 18, previously dubbed Apple's biggest update ever, will see new tools and options for home screen customization. Hmm. Mac rumors followed this up with their own sources saying that Apple will, quote, introduce the ability to create blank spaces, rows, and columns between app icons. The grid layout will remain, but it, we will be able to operate more freely within right. that grid. So like Android, although mm-hmm. I will also say, you can free place widgets on the iPad. You can. you can that that's a thing that people a lot of people don't know, but like you can free place widgets. You you can take a widget out of the grid and put it like down in the corner and mm-hmm. it just stays there. Mm-hmm. So and they've already that was the first like, oh, look at this. Something is happening that's different. So I think this is good. I've been, you know, I've been playing with all those Android e readers and stuff and uh-huh. like 
it's really nice to be able to say, I, I'll put this icon here yep. <laughs> and just have it be there instead of playing the, the weird kind of like puzzle game you do where you move one thing and then everything else moves around it. And you're like, no, that's not what I wanted. So that's, I mean, it only took them how long, but here we are. So hooray. Something else that, uh, that I like that you can do um, on the iPad is you can have different app slash widget layouts depending on portrait and landscape. Also nice, yes. I think that's yeah. like a, a nice Absolutely. Feature. I'm a big fan of that. It's good feature, stuff. Actually. I I imagine that that is all informing where they're going next with iPhone home screens. Yeah. So. Which will be very cool. Maybe, yeah. Along like with it. all the AI stuff. Sure. Uh, also, the Wall Street Journal, talking about AI stuff, is reporting that Apple is holding conversations uh, with OpenAI and Baidu as well as Google to offer AI features for the phone. This would seem to suggest that what Apple is most likely going to be doing is creating the capability for a user to choose which chatbot, I guess we could call them, just for the ease of uh, understanding, service right. that they would like to work with. In the same way that you can choose your default browser, right? So like Baidu would be in China, um, and then you'd have probably uh, OpenAI and uh, Gemini elsewhere. Um, so yeah, it's probably there will be a preference and someone will pay a lot of money for that. I expect Google, um, like, you know, like who's going to be first, like who's going to be like your, your default. Uh, but this is an interesting idea would, and I think would make a lot of sense. I would be, it would be surprising if they're going to offer this stuff and everyone's going to have it ready for September, but it's a great opportunity. So I'm sure it'll be prioritized by whoever well, decides to work with. On one level, you know, you you could make literally make a query that says, "Please respond in this form mm -hmm. <laughs> that Apple uses to parse this," and that it, it would actually respond in that form. Yeah. I do wonder if this is general purpose chatbot feature, or if some of this is what do I use as a data source when I need to get more data back from something that mm -hmm. is you know that I I don't have through one of my other data sources, and how much of this is like it could be. It could be swappable. It could happen dynamically based on on the results that you want. And I wonder about the business model because like people pay to use ChatGPT. So there's a question of like, is Apple gonna is Apple gonna pay them to use their services? And uh, if you're a you know, does it work out where like you're like, well, no, but I pay OpenAI, so I want to use their. I don't know. It's it's going to be interesting to see the the way that the business relationship gets gets sketched out here too. Mm -hmm. But I'm also wondering like. Does Apple view these sources as interchangeable or is Apple trying to make different deals for different markets or for different functionality? Um, I think it's all well, or maybe open. You can only do this if you're an iCloud Plus subscriber. Otherwise, it goes to the web. I, I don't know. You know? May maybe. Um, I also wonder if there's a, a uh, distribution of uh, volume going on here where like in the US and, and other regions that have open AI, mm -hmm. uh, GPT and Google Gemini, if if one of the concerns we mentioned last week, which is that um, there's that this could potentially be like the most AI volume ever for one of these things. And like, is there enough? Are there enough resources for this thing to stay functional? Well, one way you could make there be enough resources would be to spread it out, right? And say we're not just using Google; we're using Google and we're using OpenAI and maybe others for different queries, and uh, and then put your Siri interface in front of it. I don't know. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Squarespace, the all-in-one platform for building your brand and growing your business online. You can stand out from the crowd of a beautiful website. You can engage directly with your audience and sell your products, services, even the content that you create with Squarespace. They've got everything you need all in one place. It's so easy to get started. Squarespace has beautifully, beautiful professionally designed website templates that are ready for every category and use case of website. You can so simply customize the look of the site that you want to make. You can update the content and add features to fit your unique needs. You can make any Squarespace template do exactly what you want so your idea, brand, or business will stand out on every device. It's going to look great on all of them. 
You can take advantage of this by using Fluid Engine, Squarespace's next generation website design system. This allows you to unlock your creativity more easily than ever before. It's a reimagined drag and drop technology and it works on desktop or mobile. You can stretch your imagination online with Fluid Engine. It's making your Squarespace sites or even the more customizable and it's on any new Squarespace site that you want to make. When you are looking at building a business with Squarespace, one of the things that will be super important to you is analytics. You'll be able to learn where your site visitors and sales are coming from. You can analyze which channels are most effective for you. You can improve your website and build a marketing strategy based on your top keywords or most popular products and content. Part of that marketing strategy could be to have email campaigns. And you can do this with Squarespace too. You can encourage your visitors to sign up as email subscribers. Start them on a journey to becoming loyal customers. Once again, like with any of their templates, it's so easy you just choose the style you want but it's easy to update and change the colors and the layout and the logo and there's analytics on every send as well squarespace is so powerful it's got so many features and it only grows and gets better over time i've been a very happy squarespace customer for over 15 years and it's so easy to get started just go to squarespace.com upgrade you can sign up for a free trial. You can build your entire website and see how it's going to work and fit for you. Then when you're ready to launch it to the world, you sign up for a plan. And if you use the code UPGRADE at checkout, you'll get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. That is squarespace.com slash upgrade and the code UPGRADE when you decide to sign up to get 10% off your first purchase and show your support for the show. Our thanks to Squarespace for, the, for their support of this show and all of Relay FM. It's time for DMA Today. Literally, today, today, the European Union has published a press release stating that Apple will be involved in a DMA non-compliance investigation, along with Meta and Google. You know, I think we've touched on this briefly. Lots of companies are involved in the DMA stuff, but we just focus on Apple here because it's too, it's already too much of just Apple. Like I can't, I can't, fo I can't focus on Alphabet and Meta as well in this stuff, but. Looking at the press release that they put out, the EU is concerned that Apple is still trying to steer users away from pricing and offers that other developers offer. Uh, mm -hmm. They uh, they are not adequate. Apple uh, the EU believes that Apple is not adequately providing choices for default apps, and they are concerned that the fee structure I am assuming they mean the core technology fee may be quote defeating the purpose of the DMA as well. The investigation that they have launched could last up to 12 months. Mm -hmm. And presumably if Apple has not changed things during this period, which I assume is a possibility, um, and if they are found in non-compliance of the DMA, the fines will begin. And remember, it can be up to 10% of global revenue. So there's yeah. a lot on the line. Yeah, this is, you know, we. it's a different form of the same thing we've been saying all along, which is one of the challenges with Apple in, in Europe with the DMA is Apple. So y the EC has been supportive of the idea that Apple as a platform owner needs to do things to protect the security of the platform. And they want Apple to continue to innovate. There are all sorts of things that they, they are, they say they're not trying to do. The challenge is that, Apple is making changes, but also pointing to its role as a platform owner to say, but we need to keep this secure, so we're going to do it this way. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of these um, conflicts are visible here, where Apple is saying, uh, well, you know, we we need to do, like, let's take uh, like the, the browsers, or, or we could take the core technology fee. You know th that there's this balance, or like the um the access to side loading, and say, mm -hmm. um, well, you know, to keep it safe, we're going to erect a giant, a very high barrier that uh very few people are going to ever go go over, and that w ends up being a conversation which is like, well, wait a second, and, and as we've said in in many of these segments over the over the last few weeks, it's like, well, wait a second, you've you've set the rules of the thing that you're doing to comply to make it so that nobody will want to do it. And it's not entirely surprising that the EU regulators would come back and say, well, that wasn't the purpose. The purpose of these regulations is for you to open things up so that people will take advantage of it. So doing it, but making it so poisonous that nobody wants to actually implement it is not, in their mind, is not complying. 
right? And that that's what's going on here. And this is one of those dangers of Apple having this incremental approach is they're saying, you didn't go far enough. And the question is, and, and I don't know enough about how the EU's system works here, but it... You know, is this something where Apple is now going to get fined or is this more like Apple now has a ticking clock and the EU is going yeah. to come in and say, here are the things you need to do or we're going to give you a giant fine? Um, because at some point there has to be a hammer, right? Like whenever we, we've seen Apple make changes in the last few weeks, right? And and the question is, what's the hammer? Like, right? What motivates them to do that? What is hovering over them that's like, if you don't do this, you know, do this or else, essentially, right? What's the or else? And that big fine is the or else, right? Yes. That enormous fine is the or else. So, because um, you're talking about what? A, what is it like? I mean, it's 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 ten percent billions of global dollars revenue, but it apparently can go up to I think twenty percent if there are multiple kind of uh, right. uh, infractions. I guess so. It, it's it's not one of these like. Uh, pay a hundred million dollars and ignore the law kind of things that it's designed to have teeth. So that's, that's what's hovering over Apple. And, um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think the question is also, what do the regulators want? Like, do the regulators want Apple to do what they say? Um, or do the regulators want to make a, an example of Apple? Right. I, and I don't know the answer to that question. I think mm -hmm. they want the Apple, I think they want Apple to comply um, there's a question about like, do they want to do a big fine just because it'll be like landmark and 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 everybody will point to it and be like, oh boy, here we go. You can't. Yeah, you, there are a lot of ramifications say. to that though, right? Which is like, you might want the fine, but what happens to Apple's business in the European Union if they're going to keep right. getting these fines, right? Um, if they if for whatever reason they are un completely unwilling to make the changes, like there's a lot of like. Yeah, it's like no, I think realistically, I think you're right. EU just they just want Apple to comply because then yeah. the EU looks strong and they're getting what they want, right? Which they believe you've got to hope that they believe is the right thing to do, whether right, you know, whatever. But again, there's no preclearance though, right? Which is the funny thing about the way this is structured. Yes. It's not like, as far as I can tell, it's not like Apple took their entire plan to to the regulators and said, okay, here's what we're planning on doing. Do you have any comments for us? Like, well, you yeah. should do this more. Like, okay, I mean, we'll I get agree, we'll get back to you on that. We've also spent the last month saying, like, we don't think this looks right. You know what I mean? Right? She's like, yeah. there was a way they could have crafted their policies to be, quote, like, to not defeat the purpose of the DMA. Like, me and you have sat sure. here and been like, yeah. That doesn't seem right. Still. And that's not their strategy. That's exactly. not their strategy, right? It's to do it's to do what they think is the letter of the yep. law and then basically be told by the EU that's mm -hmm. not good enough. And and so here we have this action which is essentially saying we're investigating this because we don't think it's yeah. uh, it's good enough. And I get it, right? Like that that we've we've had numerous examples where we've said this seems contrary to the purpose of the DMA, mm -hmm. the way that Apple has chosen to do it because Apple has Right. Like what when the DMA was passed, we had a lot of sort of theoretical thoughts, theoretical stuff like like, oh, this means Apple's going to open this or this means Apple's going to change this policy. And what ended up happening was Apple opened this to a limited group defined by in, in a very narrow way by Apple. Uh, you know, Apple added this feature in a limited way with a limited set of of, uh, yeah. you know, ability they, for they developers changed to implement it. Policy X <laughs> created a new policy which inherent to the new policy would take us all the way back to the start again because you've changed it, right. but yet it's changed in such a way that no one wants to change. Right, and that's that's where the, you know, and I, I don't know if I really anticipated it being quite like that, where it was like, um, well, we, we, oh, you say we have to do uh, an app marketplace or sideloading. Um, so we're going to do an app, app marketplace and not sideloading, which turns out was not, what they intended and in order to do side loading here are all the rules and here's the money you have to put aside and here here are the other ways you have to qualify and 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 then they build up a whole bureaucratic structure on top of it which i didn't i didn't think it would be quite that strategy right which mm -hmm. is we're going to do what you say but make it impossible for almost anybody to actually use it and and that leads to this right which is we've already seen them say, oh, side loading. Yeah, we're going to add that later. Where they were obviously told this is not going to be acceptable. And then by opening this up, the non-compliance investigation, it feels like 
it's an escalation, but it's almost like an intent, intentional escalation. And it's it at least from the outside, I look at this and I think this is this is the EU arming its. Well, you can't arm a hammer, but co- you know, co- lifting the hammer, cocking the hammer. The, this well, what is if the, they had a picking up hammer, the hammer, right? If it's a jack hammer, they plugged it in. No, no, what it is? It, so there's a compliance hammer to be used yeah. here, and I this is them like. Uh, if not picking it up and 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 putting it over Apple's head, it's you know they're they they uh, they um, <laughs> they took it out of the drawer <laughs> and now it's sitting right there. Yeah. Like I could pick up this hammer at any point, uh, but that's that's what this is. So it's an escalation. It's a reminder of what the the fines are uh-huh. for not listening to them, and then it's also a be prepared for us to demand that you make yep. specific changes to your behavior, which Apple hates. But yep. like this is the game they're playing. Yep. Is they brought this on themselves by saying we're gonna do the minimum, and then you're gonna have to tell us uh, where we did it wrong, and they and the, and they are they're gonna do it. Like I understand that there are a lot of people that don't like the spirit of the law argument, right? That people want there to be letter of law, and like that's the way it goes. I understand that. I understand how complicated it can be to legislate a spirit of the law. Da, 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 da. I think that legislation like this has to be part and spirit as well as the letter. Yeah. Because that. if you, but Apple has, you could argue Apple has complied by the letter of the law, but that compliance has gotten us to a point where it was kind of a waste of time for well, everybody. I, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to go off on a, a tangent here, but I'll just say anything written can be mi- willfully misinterpreted by yes. an interested party. Yeah. Anything can be willfully misinterpreted where you think you passed a law that was very clear. I was just reading the story about this, about how there was a uh, some sort of, I forget what it was, state law that was passed somewhere. And they're like, aha, we did it. We did it. It's all very clear now. And then like one court case completely inverted the intent of the state law. Yeah. You're like, whoa, because they they encouraged a judge to read the case in a different way. And so I think implied in the whole purpose of having a regulatory regime in the European Union is when they do the DMA, they're saying, here's the big picture of what needs to happen. Here's why it needs to happen. And the regulator will ensure that it happens. And that gives the regulator some authority to say, yes, I know you parsed, like, for example, I know you parsed the thing about marketplaces and sideloading to have it be an either or, and then you're not doing sideloading. We've decided that you're doing side loading right and and i know people can get upset and be like well but you know it said either or look at the and then they're doing that thing right where you're you're reading the words on the page and saying but look uh but your honor <laughs> this says we don't have to do it and that's why you put a regulator behind it and and you the you know the the regulator is instructed you know what we want right they're, they're giving orders to the regulator like here's the laws we've written it and you know what we want to get out of this and it's your judgment about not not the judgment of a judge who's listening to the regulated it's your judgment about whether this uh this is fulfilled or not and and that puts it in the hands of the european commission two reasonable people having a disagreement would listen to each other and if something was misunderstood and corrected they would try and work together to deal with it that is not how the legal system works right where it's this idea of like well we read it this way and we can get someone to agree with us and that's the end of it and and I, i just personally don't particularly vibe with that i know it's what has happened but i don't necessarily think that just because something has been away it should be that way forever and i think that even though this is complicated and brings its own set of issues that you have to work through that this method of legislating if you'll call it that this method of rulemaking where you're kind of trying to have a conversation with the regulatory body and deal with it properly so you're getting to the intention of the law in the first place I think that I th- that that jives more with what I want from the world, mm. rather than just a couple of smart people finding a loophole in a document. Yeah, so you end up with a uh, with a, a a set of regulators who you know it's their job to, I mean, and and again, ultimately, it's a government for a region that has been given power over commerce in that region, instructing an arm of the government to uh, work with 
the companies that want to do business in the region to follow the rules. Like if we take it to the big picture, it's like, who are these people to tell Apple what to do? Well, the answer is it's Europe and Apple can be in Europe. But if you're going to be in Europe, you have to follow the laws in Europe, just like how Apple follows the laws in China. Yep. Um, if you want to be else. there, you got to follow. Th- those are your choices. Mm-hmm. You know, follow it or leave. Those are your choices. And um, as a result, you've got to you've got to listen to the regulators. Where and and if it's a tough regular, again, I think the regulators are are very focused on specific things that Apple does, but are actually kind of open to arguments from Apple on all sorts of other things. Mm-hmm. I think they're just less impressed with the idea that Apple is going to erect huge barriers to things that are mandated by the DMA in the name of of security. You know, because like again, with with creating that proxy for a, a developer in good standing of two years in the app store and a million downloads, like if I was a regulator, I, and I'm not, <laughs> I would look at that and say, you know, you've gone against the spirit of what we're trying to do here, and sort of claiming that you can't police your own developer system, and that therefore you're going to erect this huge barrier. And my thought would be, your barrier needs to be a lot lower. <laughs> And if you're afraid about fraud, it's your job to stop people from fraudulently becoming members of your development community. It's not, you know, you can't you can't put it on the regulation and say, well, we're going to just make it impossible for people to use this feature because we can't police our own app store and and our own developer membership system. Mm -hmm. And like that, that's that's the back and forth that's got to be going on right now. All right, let's close the book on law and legislation oh, and antitrust goodness. today in Goodbye, Europe DMA today. as we welcome our new segment, DOJ Today. Oh, no. Oh, the no. U.S. Department of Justice, 15 states, no, and the District no. of Columbia sued Apple last Thursday on the grounds of anti-competitive actions related to the iPhone and related products. It is a very complicated 88-page document that Jason has read. So I uh-huh. read Jason's article, and we're going to oh, use that, which was very good, felt to me anyway. Everybody Who out knows? there can just listen to Mike, and it will go from the Department of Justice to me to Mike to you. Yep, that's how it works, and we're going to use yep. that as a framework for discussion today. So you broke this down into a bunch of segments, and we'll start by, you know, if we're looking at antitrust, we need to start by saying there's a monopoly, right? That's how we get to this point, so... The DOJ is suing Apple on the grounds of anti-competitive behavior. Anti is it anti-competitive or antitrust? Is that or are they the same? They are the yeah antitrust. A trust is like a monopoly. It's a, it's All right. a from the, it goes dates back to the days of railroads and oil companies wonderful. being monopolies. Wonderful, 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 great. Uh, so we need to first define a monopoly. So the, the Department of Justice has tried to do that. Um, a sixty percent share of the u.s smartphone market which is what apple has is not a monopoly it's not enough right it's not a monopoly doesn't seem like it so they are kind of carving it up um in a few ways Mm -hmm. one the department of justice is using revenue generate instead of units sold they have created a new sub market of smartphone called performance smartphone which pushes apple up to 70 percent and they also accuse apple of attempting to create a monopoly through various tactics. So even if they haven't got like 90% of the market, they're really trying to get it. Is that fair? For, I mean, I've just summarized your summary. but Yeah, yeah. The idea here is they need to establish why this is a monopoly, and it's actually kind of hard. And so they have said, well, it's just in the U.S., and it's just revenue, and it's it, it, and if that's not good enough, it's just performance smartphones which gets us up to you know 70 percent revenue share and then i'd say the the other thing they do that in my mind suggests that they that they uh know that their numbers aren't very strong and they're just trying to they're they're trying to make their case here um at one point they do finally get to a number that i think most people would say is verging on a monopoly which is a number that uh starts at 90 um, and they do that by making the bold claim that 90% of the smartphone market is controlled by Apple and Google and Samsung put together, which is so amazing, right? Where they're like, ha we got to 90 by adding in two competitors who are not part of this lawsuit. <laughs> I don't, it's bananas. But the truth is, historically, um, there the what is what defines a monopoly is not like, a number it is it has to do with the power exerted over the entire market as defined what that market is that's defined and um 
it also can vary based on even the regions, uh, the the circuit courts mm -hmm. of the federal uh, judicial system. And if you um, if you're wondering why they filed in New Jersey, New Jersey, this circuit court had a case where they found that a company involved in making like dentures and accessories or something had a 60 some percent market share. And they said they were a monopoly because mm -hmm. of the way that they use their power. And they undoubtedly picked this court because of that. So I, you know, I'm not a lawyer. I look at this and I think it doesn't pass the sniff test of being a monopoly, but they will make some very clever, as we said before, you can argue anything and you could say, well, Apple doesn't have a monopoly in the sense of being 90% of the market, but the power they exert over the smartphone market is such that they are behaving as a monopoly. That would be the argument. It's just, you know, this would be easier if Apple's real market share was 70%. This would be way easier if it was 80%. And this would be, I would say, a slam dunk if it were 90%. So I think it is an issue where they really have to, they have to make the case that Apple exerts huge control over this market. And Apple's defense is going to be that it's a highly competitive market and that Apple, everything Apple is doing is because they have brutal competition, not just in the US, but all around the world. And the more they can globalize it, the lower their market share gets because the US is their best market. So this is kind of interesting because it dovetails from what we were just talking about. So like for me, this is like, I don't care about percentages, like me personally. Because it, it that last point that Apple attempts to create a monopoly through various tactics, and we're going to go through those tactics that the DOJ is setting out, I think that that is the key to it. That like Apple is trying really hard, and if they could they would very happily take that 90% and treat it exactly the same. Sure, sure. Yeah, the challenge The challenge is um, that legal tactics uh, by a regular company become illegal when a monopoly does them. Yeah. So there's, there, there's this fuzzy line, um, and, and you can make the, hi the historical claim, right, that Apple's market share has actually grown a little bit, but like they are, they are locked in a battle with Google... And Android in in general, and Samsung in particular, in the premium category, and that this is a fierce competition, and that uh, Apple's decisions are based on that, and not based on control. Like, like, because in the end, it's about is Apple just trying to uh, take its power to reap, you know, all these benefits, or is it doing it because it is locked in a in a struggle with the competition and it's competing? And that's one of the things we have to deal with. I should also say for people who don't you know, have not spent any time thinking about antitrust law or aren't in the U.S., uh, you may be saying to yourself, why does it matter? Like, they obviously have a big market share and they're very powerful and you can put them together with Samsung and Google and get them over 90%. And really, if you look at it as iOS and Android, it's 100% essentially of the smartphone market. And, and, and that gives Apple as one of two major players and gatekeepers enormous control over the market, right? Which is what the EU's argument is, right? Mm -hmm. Except for this. You got to, in order to, to have a lawsuit, you got to have a law. <laughs> it's got to be illegal. They got to do something illegal. Yes. And the United States has been very bad at passing new laws about yeah, like things the like. The DMA is a law. And then the they DMA wrote law. the law and then said you have to comply with it. Yeah. And, and, and they wrote it with the big tech co companies in mind. The Sherman Antitrust Act is what the Department of Justice is using. It It is uh, well over 100 years old. It was written for the era where there were huge monopolies in things like in, in cutting edge industries like trains and oil. And but this is the thing is that's all they got. That's all they got. And, and, and monopoly law and antitrust law has, has evolved over time, and there are lots of complex definitions of it now because you have to kind of evolve it. Otherwise, all you're going to get is the Rockefellers and the Stanfords of the world right? the, 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 from the 19th and early 20th centuries. And, and so it has evolved. But this is what they have to use. So if you're wondering, like, why are we even arguing about if Apple's a monopoly? Why can't we just talk about Apple's behavior? The fact is that if the Department of Justice can't definitively prove that Apple is behaving as a monopoly, they have no case because Apple's not being accused of doing anything that's illegal 
in general. Mm -hmm. They're being accused of doing things that are illegal for people with monopoly power to do. And that's the huge difference. And in my opinion... everything is about the monopoly. In my opinion, I mean, it's not just my opinion, one of the worst things that happened here is Epic took Apple to court. Because there is nothing in here about the App Store, right? Like about Apple's control of the App Store. Because Epic and Apple have already had this fight and Epic lost. And I feel like... If the Department of Justice could have included in here things about the App Store, then we'd be on. We'd be talking about a different kettle of fish. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I mean, there's stuff in there. They mention it, but they they are steering away from it. And this is okay. Um, There's a lot of talk about this. This has been out there for a little while now. And and there are people who are like, aha, take it to big tech. And there are other people who are like, this is ridiculous. This is such a stupid thing. It's a waste of everybody's time. Um, I would say my frustration with this is that there are lots of things Apple does that I don't like and that I think are questionable in terms of their behavior, in terms of things that I think that Apple is doing that seem very unfair and that they're using their power and their control of their, um, their platform to be Mm anti-competitive. There are lots of examples of that. Very few of them are in this lawsuit. (laughs) And and part of it it is that um, already in the Epic Games case, a lot of this stuff was sort of run up the flagpole and found to be not super convincing. Doesn't mean they can't make those arguments again. And this legal panel could say, actually, we do believe those arguments. But it makes it harder. And I think it also suggests, given some of the weak arguments that are in this first filing, I would say anything you don't see in here is probably not because they forgot about it. It's it, it's because it felt even weaker to them to allege. Um, and as a result, I'm frustrated by this because I look at this and I think it's kind of misguided. You missed a huge opportunity. And some of the stuff that you are picking is dumb, right? Like, is this the best you can do is sort of how I walk away from this. Uh, because I don't think that there aren't any competitive urges that apple has that they have been exercising over more than a decade but uh two things one is it illegal and that's on congress right that's on the lawmakers to make laws about is it legal or not as opposed to just feels real icky you know and so like is it illegal or not and then is and then the other thing is the department of justice like do they even get it is the other my other concern is it, it's it's people remember when we talked about the AI pin the humane AI pin yeah and one of the things that we picked out about it was there's this it's a cool demo and it's a cool product and I, I think it's actually very instructive that if you don't have a smartphone platform that you own that's dominant it's very hard for you to even make a presence in the market I, I which again it's not illegal, but I think it's troubling about where the market is now with the two huge companies that control it. But the big thing about the Humane AI pen was also that their whole thing is sort of like, isn't it great? You can be freed from your smartphone. <laughs> and you and I both were talking about how people like their phones, right? Like they're, they're looking at them all the time. They like them. They're, there's no, I, I've yet to see one of those, you know, like those late night commercials that are like, oh, I'm tired of opening cans. I hate it. I open cans all day. And somebody's like, I've got a can opener for you, right? It's a little like that, which is like, oh, I'm tired of looking at my phone all the time. There's all these games and I can scroll in social media. I would help me AI pin, right? That doesn't exist. And I think of that about this lawsuit too, which is the lawsuit has a real tenor like, um, people don't like the iPhone when in fact the customer satisfaction, as Tim Cook would tell us, very high on the iPhone. People love the iPhone. They love it. And there is a there is an undercurrent in this suit of this idea, because one of the things that they're really trying to challenge is lock in, the idea that Apple traps its customers in its ecosystem and it can't get out. And there is no doubt, no doubt, no denying the fact that Apple sees lock in as a benefit. Yeah. And Apple likes lock in. Apple bet likes they making have it so stickiness. much discovery. Like documents yeah. and emails that sure. confirm that part of executives saying, "Yeah, we love it. We love, we it. love why, it. Why, why love would it. we? They do. Why would we give make it easier to switch to our competition? All which is again not illegal <laughs> if you're not a monopoly. But Apple's but, just very good at it. 
but the the tenor of the of the way the the document is written is very much like aha through nefarious means apple has trapped people in their ecosystem they don't want to be there anymore they want to escape but they can't they've been trapped and it has this it really has this whiff of that classic argument that people who buy apple hardware uh, or apple products in general are just dupes of marketing and buy coolness sheep. and exactly and that it, and that then they're trapped and then they're just harvested for all their cash by apple and it's like both of these so so apple desiring Making decisions that enable lock-in and, and making their ecosystem sticky is a thing, right? But when I read about it in this case, I, I, I think to myself, is your end argument that people don't want to be on the iPhone, but they're stuck there? Because I don't think that's actually true, right? Like, I think it's not a prison. But they can make the argument that because of Apple's actions, people can't even dare to think right like and that's the is, argument they can make yes and this is what uh, something you and i have talked about a lot here too which is i always have thought apple behaves the apple should have more confidence in itself and yes. i know people are what do you mean apple's very arrogant it's like yeah but apple uh, we did that episode where it's like they own the field they own the refs mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I it's like they why compete is apple's attitude it's like why compete if we don't have to and I think Apple does believe that their products are superior, but they also believe that they shouldn't have to compete because why? Why bother? And and a lot of these regulatory exercises we're going through here are uh, those groups saying one by lawsuit, by regulation, whatever, saying no, you need to you need to actually compete on the merits, which I think is funny because I think Apple competes fine on the merits, <laughs> and in some areas where they don't compete on the merits, I think it's true that they would work harder if they had to compete. Uh, again, is that illegal or not? Depends on if they're a monopoly, depends on a bunch of other things. But it is, they, they kind of bring this on themselves because what they're doing is saying, we want it to be sticky, we want lock-in, uh, because why wouldn't we? And as a result, that's evidence of them saying we don't want competition, which is not great if you're in an antitrust lawsuit. I just, you know, we're, we're going to get into some of the details here, but like there is just like a, like a thing for me where it's like, I don't think a company can make $22 billion a quarter and not expect to be regulated. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. like the, yeah. this was going to yeah. happen. It's just yeah, happening I, this way. I mean, one of my pet theories is always that Ap Apple's whole corporate culture is based on when they were the little guy who was about to go out of business, going yeah. up against enormous adversaries who had monopoly power and that they were just trying to survive. And that they still have that attitude, even though the shoe is on the other foot now. And I think you see the, that in stuff like this, where um, y you, yes, if you and one of your competitors control- God, I so grossly control... said that wrong. T let me say $90 okay. billion dollars a quarter, sorry, not 20. Uh, that no, was just I, one product yeah. is what I was thinking of. <laughs> I mean, let's, 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 let's break it down. And again, this is not about law. This is just about like common sense, right? Smartphone is basically required for everybody, every human on planet Earth. Yeah. And there's only two kinds. Yeah. Google and Apple. Yeah. Within, I mean, again, I'm sure next year is the year of Linux in the pocket, but um, <laughs> like really. AI in the bin. <laughs> and, 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 and I know there's different different Androids in, in, no, in China. No, there's stuff, two. But, like, but there's two. That you've but let's, let's Android just say, there's iOS. two platforms. That's what you've got. There's two platforms yeah. here. For the most important product in the world, essentially, most mm -hmm. important tech product in the world. Do we not think that if there are only two, that they have enormous amounts of power over the human race? And do we not think that perhaps governments might want to have a say about how they perform some aspects of their business? I think it's not unreasonable to say that. And the also, challenge when is, there are two, and one of them has more than half, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. That's and, the problem. And, and in the US, U.S., they do have more than half. But the the problem is the governments don't work on vibes; they work on laws. <laughs> and in the U.S., there are not a lot of laws uh, that directly address this stuff. So they gotta they gotta go with something like the Sherman Antitrust Act, which has been used used against Microsoft. Um. Anyway, yeah, it's so. This is where we are. Is I think I think uh, you and I have come back to one of my initial points, which is feels like there's something here, and this doesn't feel like it's it. But this is what we got. But it might be though, like. Maybe it might be enough, right? Like it might be enough because let's go through well, some of these things. Yeah, so. yeah. I was going to say it might be enough in the sense that it might spur Apple to make changes that are substantial. It might be enough for a judge to agree with. Sure, sure. Depending on the details, 
Absolutely. Because okay, let's 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 we have all of these it. points, and I saw someone say this, and I, and I, and I thought that it was a really good argument. Like some of these points seem strange, unless maybe they have a lot of evidence that makes them make sense, right? Where like you say, look, Apple does this thing, we know it because here's the emails. One of them is suppressing cross-platform technologies. Uh, the idea that Apple makes it harder for developers to release software that works the same on iOS and Android, therefore making it harder for users to switch and know that they would have a comparable experience if they had a different uh, uh, phone. The Department of Justice yeah. cite that some of these things that are uh, suppressed are cloud streaming games, third-party messaging apps not being able to receive incoming SMSs so you are pushed yeah. into iMessage, which I actually right. thought was enlightening. I was like, I, it's a it's an unexpected argument, but the argument is basically Apple built iMessage on the fact that it was the default message yeah. receiver and on I the think platform. That is a yeah. super strong argument to me. Right? They they put their messaging service in the SMS app. Exactly. Uh, smartwatches, other than the Apple Watch, not being able to be fully featured. Digital wallets, and the one that is the weirdest to me, super apps. Super apps. Super apps are mostly popular in asia and there are a few different ones uh, wechat yeah. is often cited but whatsapp is actually one i th really in, in india especially where it's yeah, essentially there's, a, there's, a, there's like a tata something yep. um super app in india too but they're uh, very, where very popular one app where you do loads of stuff so one app where you message you have payments you can order food you can order cars right like it's yeah. a whole thing they build little mini apps. They basically build a platform that is the app, and then they have little mini apps inside it that they control. And so you end up in a, in a situation in China where one of the things about the Chinese market, and I know we, we talk about this when we do the quarterly stuff here, is that in China, if everything you do is in WeChat, then um, you can go to an Android phone, and as long as there's WeChat, which there is, you can do everything there too. And you can go to iPhone, and there's WeChat, so you do everything there. And th this is... The, the whole cross-platform thing, what, what the Department of Justice is trying to say is Apple makes it hard to switch and that that is a, an anti-competitive action and it should be easier to switch. And there, I think there are, if, if you try to unravel that, it gets really weird because I think that behind it is, is a technological naivety, naivety about, um, about platforms being different and the idea that, that uh, you know, we're not going to say all software must be developed with the same APIs, right? Like that that's bizarre. And yet if if they're different, the more different they are, the harder it is to switch between them. Also, I would argue that you know, if I were to switch from iOS to Android today, I would lose my Apple Watch because it's not compatible. But I could replicate everything else I do on Android, right? So switch the cost of switching, I'm I'm a little bit skeptical of, but I think it's an interesting lens for them to view this situation, which is to say how easy it is to switch. And in China, it's very easy to switch. Now the the problem with that is that there's another monopoly, <laughs> which is the super app. That's the which is itself part a me. monopoly. I can't believe that the Department of Justice <laughs> in an antitrust case is asking for Uber to be the place where I live my life, which is essentially yeah, but, but, what I would have, right? Which but here's so the idea, weird. Mike. The idea, and this this comes in somewhere else, which is the whole argument in this document, which is that the only reason we're here today is because the DOJ sued Microsoft, which something 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 big question mark allowed Apple to flourish, yeah. which is not true. It's it's a it's a laugh. Uh, it is them patting themselves on the back. Uh, but if you if you view it through the lens of that, then the super app thing, you could say, oh well, this is great because it'll give them work. Um, for the next decade when a super <laughs> app becomes a monopoly apps. they can sue them <laughs> they can sue them great the department of justice say that apple have total control they exert power over the platform to limit developers and users yeah can't, can't argue yeah. with that one <laughs> no i mean that's that, that right not not a bad so yeah cross platform total control um are i think the the and, and lock in right and those are the releasing those are the big arguments new products that work with each other and they keep trying to go into new markets and over time they will just do right. that more and more and more right. until and, they can and try and control all of the stuff in technology. And that right. is that is definitively I would say the, de the the defining characteristic of an illegal monopoly is that you have a huge power base in one area and then from there you can exert it elsewhere. 
and your competitors can't can't compete elsewhere with you because of your base in your monopoly because it's very hard to compete with somebody who's got that level of power. And so with Microsoft, the argument was Microsoft wasn't allowing browser competition because it had operating system dominance. And they lost that case, basically. They, they, they changed how they did it, and they had to unbundle IE, and all of those things happened. And then Apple came along. So look, hooray. So um, that, that's one of the challenges here is these, um, are, are they using that power in a narrowly defined monopoly to, I mean, the smartwatch thing is a good example where like what they're not saying, what the DOJ is not saying really is uh, Apple not bringing the Apple watch to Android is monopolistic, right? Like that, th that's a very weird argument to make to say, yes. if you don't support other platforms, you're bad. Like we, it's illegal to release it for your only your own platform. It's it not what they're saying. What they're saying though, that Garmin, doesn't have an API, right, to be able so to get the, messages. And there's arguments that they that there is that to some degree, and I want to see the evidence. But the the argument that I think has more resonance, if it's true, is Apple, and, and it sounds like something Apple would do, right? Which is Apple built a whole bunch of APIs for the Apple Watch so mm -hmm. that the Apple Watch would work well. And I don't think anybody would say that is fundamentally bad. I think people would, I mean, maybe there's somebody at the Department of Justice, but I think it's a reasonable person would say, Apple innovating with its own product mm -hmm. and building a whole bunch of stuff to let its own product work is not inherently bad. The challenge that the DOJ sees here is, and I don't know whether it's, at the time it ships or within a reasonable amount of time is Apple built all that stuff for the Apple watch. And the argument goes, and the allegation is that other smartwatches try to get access to all of that uh, close tie in with the system that allows them to function at the same way that they do on Android and they can't. Mm -hmm. And that's their argument is that Apple, and, and then it goes to cross platform and, and lock in, by saying essentially, if you want to use a smartwatch on an iPhone, you can only use Apple's uh, because the others aren't very good because they're being anti-competitive. And of course, it doesn't work on the other platform. So if you switch, you're not just buying a new phone; you have to buy a new watch now. And that's all about lock-in and anti-competitiveness. That's the argument that they're making. And I think again, the idea that at some point Apple needs to let other smartwatches work on the iPhone, they can't just make it that the well, the Apple Watch works the best. Th that if somebody wanted to put in the investment, if Google wanted to put the investment to have one of the Google smartwatches work as as well with iOS as the Apple Watch does, they should be able to do that. That's the argument. They also say that Apple uses security for convenience. I'm going to read a quote from you, which includes a quote from the Department of Justice. Yes, thank you. It calls Apple's privacy and security justifications an elastic shield that can stretch or contract to serve Apple's interests. Yes. Yeah. Go off, DOJ. <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, yeah. they do well, do this. They do. They absolutely do. And, and you know, the problem is, I mean, elastic, elastic shield is actually really great. Because in, in, implication in there, this is my favorite line in the whole document. Um, the implication there is... It stretches or contracts to serve its interests. It's not what it's not saying is Apple says, you know, like we've heard these troll arguments before, right? Which is like, well, Apple says that privacy and security matter, but it don't really, all that matters to them is money. It's like, that's not true. Privacy and security absolutely matter to Apple, and it's absolutely a priority for them. It is also true that Apple's behavior is not only prioritizing privacy and security, it also is about their own interests, about money, maybe about lock-in. Those things are also in there. And once you let those things creep in, it makes it easier for, say, the Department of Justice to point at it and say, you're hiding behind security. Like we said about the the rules in Europe for letting somebody into the store where they're like, oh, well, yeah, you can do side loading. You just have to spend two years in a penalty box and a mil get, find a way to get a million downloads in Europe. And then and then you're free to do what you want. Right. Like, And we have to do this because of platform security. Um, and, and it's like, well. There are probably other ways to answer that problem, but you've decided to make it about platform security. There are, I, what I would say is like, it's not consistent. There are examples where Apple uh, is doing features that benefit privacy and security, that it's entirely about privacy and security. 
There are cases where it's mostly about privacy and security, but they also look at it and say, oh, we could also make some money here. And it has the added effect of having a little lock-in. It's good for us. And they do it. And then there are other ones where they talk about the privacy and security, and you look at it and you go, really? Because it seems to me like your real motivator here is 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 that this gives you more power or control or money mm-hmm. or some combination of those. And that's that's been... Uh, and and again they have nobody but themselves to blame because they could they muddy these waters they muddy these waters with their business decisions and it is like one of the things that you cannot avoid from this and i think one of the things that's going to continually come back to buy apple is they are always talking about the tight integration between hardware and software that that is what they care about they promote heavily on this Mm-hmm. Is it now said that this is illegal to do? I don't know. But the fact that they have been so hell-bent on this idea that mm-hmm. only their stuff can work together, that's mm-hmm. now going to become a problem for them. This is this is one of the more existential threats to Apple, is this idea that Apple's whole idea of integrated d- devices is actually illegal, given how successful they are on the iPhone. Mm-hmm. I don't think I don't think that that's quite right though. I think there's a model here that's in clear view and I don't know the details, but like the Apple Watch is a good example. We could use others. Apple does this thing where they announce a new product and it's like I mean AirPods are like this too, yeah. right? Where it's like, "Oh, well Bluetooth wasn't good enough, so we invented a new thing." And it makes our headphones way better than anybody else's headphones on our platform. Yep. I don't think that that is in any way illegal. That's Apple's business model. It's how they make good products. Yep. The challenge, and th- this might make the whole thing untenable, which is the danger for Apple. The challenge is, if you read that as being, we built a bunch of stuff that only we ever get access to, and it means that our product in this category will always be better than any of the other products in this category. And you can buy other earbuds if you really want to, but they're never going to be as good as ours. So you Ooh. might as well just buy, buy ours. I have right? an example. Find My, the Find My network. So they built their own privacy tracking device. So their tracking device, right? The AirTag. But Apple yep. knew this was going to be a problem for them because they were already in trouble with about tile, right? Right. So they created a system where you can make a product like this and apply, and you would be in the Find My network, which benefits from the, from the majority of features that an AirTag has. So they've shown they can do this. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, the latest example is the journaling app, which includes all sorts of things that are about your phone watching what you do, mm-hmm. what music you play, what podcasts you listen to, where you've been, what photos you've taken... A lot of stuff that has to happen on device because, you know, you, you it's monitoring you, right? But it's your device and, it, and, it, and it's monitoring you because it's with you all the time. And then you decide what you want to do with it. Mm-hmm. And what Apple, in the past, I would argue what Apple would have done is announce the journaling app and release it. And only Apple's app would have access to all that data. Mm-hmm. And instead, what they did, did is they built an API and they released an app that uses the API and they opened that API up to other apps to get that same data. And, and I know there's details there. I don't want to get into it. My point is, this is the kind of thing that is the, is the model, potentially, which is, so, so you do the Apple Watch. The question is, what's Apple's burden to allow others access to this stuff? I think the argument would be, Apple, you cannot create private APIs, essentially, for your integrations that no one else gets access to so that you can exert your platform ownership power to prevent any competition on the platform. Now, the a lot there are a lot of arguments inside there, which is, does that mean that every time, you know, because the, the way that would hamper innovation is saying to Apple, every time you do anything innovative at all, you immediately need to release a detailed API spec and have everything be public so that somebody else can come in very quickly and write to all of those APIs. And... There are cases where that's probably really fair, right? Like you're a, you're a third party who's been trying to serve this market. I mean, I don't know. You're Pebble, <laughs> back in the day for smartwatches. You're you're day you're you're, you're day one, or you're you're an app, you're an app that's desperately wanted an API for something, and then a- Apple decides to make an app like your app, and now there's an API for it. 
um, the least they could do is let you also access the API. So the question is like, does that have to happen when they ship it? Because that's going to increase the burden on Apple of, it, it would be the equivalent, I mean, this is the wrong example because it was in the early days of the iPhone, but it'd be the equivalent of saying, you can't ship the iPhone until you have an app store. It's that kind of thing, right? Where they're like, no, 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 we need time. We don't even have the developer tools built yet. We ship the product. We can do the product, but doing the developer documentation and all those things, it's going to take more time. We, we still are ha having to work on that. It's like, okay, fair enough. That's where we are with, with stuff like this, which is it, it's, it's probably okay for Apple. It's okay for Apple to innovate. It's probably okay for Apple to ship a product that does some amazing new things. But I think what the argument would be is it's not okay for Apple to take all of the extra connective tissue that they built that makes their integrated product work and keep it to themselves as the platform owner so that no one else can make a competitive product and have access to that same stuff. And therefore, therefore everybody who uses an iPhone is really going to be predisposed to buy AirPods because AirPods work better. And, and that's, that's, I think that's the biggest potential danger and change and why this thing talks about AP, uh, private APIs. I think is like, it's a huge, to me, that's a huge thing because it, it, it's, it, that's the one that, that blares out to me as being anti-competitive, which is it's not about Apple innovating. It's about Apple innovating and keeping all of the innovations on the hardware side as special to the platform owner, leading to a situation where nobody can compete with a platform owner on its platform anywhere in any other product. And that's, I mean, this goes back to our complaints about things like the Kindle books and, yeah. and, and stuff like that, where it's like Apple has built a product on its platform and made it impossible for anyone to compete with them. That seems anti-competitive to me, right? Mm -hmm. That's where, that's where it bugs me. And some of that's in here, not all of it, but some of it's in here. So obviously Apple's going to fight this. Uh, they've released a statement. This is from 9to5Mac. We believe this lawsuit is wrong on the facts and the law, and we will vigorously defend against it. And this is going to take years. There will be lots of hearings. We'll learn lots took, of interesting things, maybe. Microsoft took a decade. Yep. Microsoft took a decade. There will be lots of documents released from the discovery process, which will be fascinating. I'll look forward oh, to yeah. reading through A lot of emails from yeah. people who shouldn't have been using email. <laughs> yep. Yes. If there's one thing <laughs> in the last few years I've taught anyone... You shouldn't use email, but what you also shouldn't do is say, let's not use email, because Google did that, and then they lost. So everyone, yeah. you need to say in person to everyone, don't write anything down, and then you end up yeah. in a problem where no one can work because nothing's written down. Yeah, I know. Well, write a, it all down on paper. That's the trick. Hey, Apple, I have some notepads to say if you want them. I, 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 don't know what, I, I don't know how to break this to you, Mike, but that, that's how this whole thing started is this paper is subpoenable. But then you can shred it. Just like, uh-oh. Just write it all down on paper, mm. shred it at the end of the day. The upgrade program does not I endorse do. the idea <laughs> of destroying evidence. <laughs> well, here's the, it's like shredding as evidence, right? At what point is something evidence? How do you know it's evidence? You know? Yeah, when they sue you. <laughs> but then it's gone. You shredded it, did it? Yeah, maybe. So we're probably going to need a new name for this segment because now yeah, we have DOJ yeah. today and DMA I, today. I don't want two different things based on jurisdictions, and this doesn't help us when there's something in Korea that yeah. happens or well, in Japan. At first, it didn't seem like we need necess We didn't know we were going to need it. You know what I mean? So yeah. uh, answers on a postcard. Go to upgradefeedback.com. Give us your suggestions. Uh, I, I asked ChatGPT for some suggestions, Jason. Oh, no. I just thought it might be an interest. You know, you never know what you're going to get. So, but what I wanted specifically was I wanted something with up, right? Up something. Uh huh. Because right? we've done that in the past. The best that it gave me, which I don't like, but the best that it gave me was uphold. But I don't like it. Ugh, no. So we'll see. We'll come up with it. Send in your suggestions. Upgradefeedback.com. If you have what you think is a good name. For Overarching for for Apple and, and legal all issues, legislation stuff. Send it in because this is how we got upshift. Uh, but we've it's true as we know, and we need to replace. We, we lost that one, so we gotta we gotta get a new one in. But yeah, I think I think DMA today is going to be retired because now we need a broader Apple under scrutiny mm -hmm. um, thing, whatever it yeah. might be. So yes, send it, send in upgradefeedback.com. We would love to hear from you. This episode is brought to you by Vitally. 
Customer success teams today, they're facing a problem. How do they connect customer data back to their work? Vitally changes this. It is a new kind of customer success platform, an all-in-one collaborative workspace that combines your customer data with the capabilities you expect from today's project management and work platforms. Because it's designed for today's customer success team, that is why Vitally operates with unparalleled efficiency, improves net revenue retention, and delivers best-in-class customer experiences. It is the solution to helping your customer success teams keep a better pulse on your customers, maximizing productivity, visibility, and collaboration along the way. You can boost your bottom line by driving more revenue per customer with Vitally. It is that simple. And if you take a qualified demo of Vitaly, you can get yourself a free pair of AirPods Pro. So if you're a customer success decision maker actively seeking CS solutions, working at a B2B software as a service company with 50 to 1,000 employees, and you're willing to explore changing customer success platforms if you have one in place, schedule your call today just by going to vitaly.io slash upgrade and get that free pair of AirPods Pro. That's V-I-T-A-L-L-Y dot I-O slash upgrade for a free pair of AirPods Pro when you schedule a qualified meeting. Our thanks to Vitaly for their support of this show and Relay FM. It's draft time. We wanted to have some fun because we've been talking a lot about legislation. And you know what's on the horizon? iPads. So it hasn't happened yet, which is fantastic. I was checking the Apple newsroom furiously today. But as of recording on Monday, the 25th of March, there have been no iPad announcements. So we're doing an iPad draft. What this will also do is hopefully give us at least three drafts this year, which is good from a scoring perspective when it comes mm-hmm. to drafts. These are the rules. Got to make some drafts where we can. Yeah, we've got to do it. This is a great idea from you. I'm happy that you came up Thank with you. it. Thank you. Especially Thank because you. we're going to be talking about so much legal stuff. It's not our first preemptive draft, right? Like no. We've done it before, but yes. I felt like I was listening to Connected last week, and I had that moment where I thought, you know, there's a lot of unknown things. And fortunately, Mark Gurman on Sunday did not have big yeah. iPad news to share, and he's off next week. So, <laughs> so I thought this would be a really good time for us to just be on the details of the iPad, and then yeah. we'll see what happens when it happens, and we'll score it then. These are the rules. There will be eight rounds. 16 overall picks. Mm -hmm. The winner of the previous draft gets first pick. That is me. There are some slight amendments to these rules because of the way we're doing it. The items that we're going to be picking from are chosen from a predetermined list that we have agreed upon and are not ridiculously obvious. For an item to count, it must be known for certain before scoring begins. What's the difference this time? Stephen Hackett, because it's not like there's not going to be an event probably, and we're going to leave it all the way up until we score it. Yeah. Stephen Hackett will adjudicate in case of a scoring stalemate. There are no partial points. The points awarded on the episode of final and are finalized during the scoring segment. In the case of a tie, there is a tiebreak question. The loser gets pick of tiebreaker question. The winner becomes draft champion and displays the champion pennant. The loser becomes the draft challenger and displays the challenger pennant. Oh, yes. You can find interactive scorecards for this draft and all drafts over at Upgrade.Cards, thanks to our friend Zach Knox. You can buy your own draft t-shirt anytime at UpgradeYourWardrobe.com if you would like to show off your love for the draft. In 2023, there were three drafts. WWDC, September <sighs> or October. I won all of them. Yeah. And I, am the tw- I was also the 2023 draft champion, obviously, if I won mm-hmm. all three. There have been three drafts historically in March. Jason has won them all. Fun fact. Mike, t- I think we should do a draft in March. <laughs> the 2022 <laughs> March draft was the last time Jason I, won a draft. I am on a losing streak. We're going to yeah. have to abolish drafts pretty soon. You think that's the way we're going to deal with this? Interesting. <laughs> that's very interesting. Uh, we usually do... Uh, so in in a case of, a, as I mentioned before, if there's a, if there's a tie, there's a tiebreaker question. Jason is going to be able to, to set an over-under on the tiebreaker we decided, which is what will be the iPad Pro starting price. So, Jason, yes. you set the number, and I will set whether it's over or under. So I guess this is for the 11-inch, right? Like, yeah, it's, it's the, the, lowest lowest, price. the lowest price that you can buy in to a new iPad Pro. If they keep an old model around, which they won't, but if okay. they do, that doesn't count. Uh, current iPad Pro, do you know the starting price? $799 for the 11-inch. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Yep. Um, I am going to say... <laughs> Jason, a, this is from Spoll in the chat. Does Mike have a draft monopoly? Someone alert the Department of Justice. Yeah, I know. That's right. <laughs> you're using you're using your draft monopoly against me. Uh huh. Yeah. Hey, you know, you want you want to say that it's just competition, but uh-huh. I do. Um, I'm gonna say so. Seven ninety nine is the current. I'm gonna say nine hundred and fifty dollars as the starting the, price. Is the nine hundred fifty dollars is the starting price? Yes, under. Hmm. Okay. I think that's so. You get not you get nine forty nine and eight ninety nine and and even seven ninety nine if they keep it the same. Yeah. I I thought about going at eight ninety nine or mm-hmm. nine hundred. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's going to be nine ninety nine. It could well, but we'll be, see. but I'm I'm going to take the under on it because. It's okay. a bi- it's a big jump, right? It's a big, big jump. It is, it is. And we'll, but... we maybe t- we'll talk about why, but I think I'm going to take the under on it. All right. So we're not doing categories in this. We have lots of different uh, picks across all of the various iPads that we're yes. going we're to choose from. Um, but we're just doing this as like eight rounds. So my first pick, both iPad Pro models have an OLED screen. Okay. All right. This is this feels real obvious. Yeah. But I didn't line it out like I did some of them. Yeah. Um I still think that there's a non-zero chance that they'll pull a gotcha and they'll be like I a agree. non like the the lo, the low end model won't have OLED after all. And look, or they just don't even do you know what I mean? Like we mm-hmm. thought they were going to do mini LED on the 11 inch and they never did it. So right. I I feel like it's until for something like this, like a technology like this, I do feel like there is a possibility that it could change at any moment because of an issue until they've done it once. You know what right. I mean? And until right. they've until they've had an OLED iPad Pro, they've not had one. It's also, it's Schrodinger's OLED. <laughs> I'm, I, yeah. I, it's like it's like I read something over the weekend. I didn't, but it just keeps coming into my mind. Good old Schrodinger. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, I'm gonna go with. There's a new Apple Pencil. Okay, I had this in. So I make a provisional list. I think we both do this, right? Like we we mm-hmm. and we rank them. I had this at number ten on my right. potential pick list. I just feel like now's the time for it. I mean, it is yeah. possible that they will they will do it later, but I feel like if there's new iPad Pro model and there's a new Apple Pencil coming, that this would be the time to do it. So why not yep. do it right now? We have a lot of potential Apple Pencil picks, so let's not give let's not talk about the Apple Pencil yet right. in case it okay. comes up through other things. Okay. Uh, my second pick will be a very popular one if it happens, which is that the webcam is on the horizontal edge of the iPad Pro. Yep. That's a good call. It feels like, like it. this one feels like it's got to happen because they did it on the iPad. And like, it would really, this feels to me that you they did it on that one because that was the the first one that they changed after making that decision, and now it should come to the other products, in my opinion. Yeah, no, makes sense to me. And if they have a brand new design of the iPad Pro, then like it, it, I imagine it would be hard to have a new revision of the previous iPad Pro and do that, because they designed that iPad in a certain way. But you've got to imagine if this iPad Pro has new technology in it, like an OLED screen, there was going to need to be some change to the way that the product was made. And so if you're going to go back to the design drawing board again, that you would you would also include something that like this, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's coming to all of them. The mm-hmm. only question would be, again, that Apple disappoints us, and we think, oh, yes. yeah, 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 it'll be the next time. And they're like, no. To no, be fair, that is no. the that is the under like the underwriting current of all drafts, is we can be t- <laughs> It's that Apple may disappoint us. It's yeah. always there. It's always there. Now, we aren't allowing anybody to pick there will be a new Magic Keyboard. Correct. Because that feels fairly strong. So I'm going to choose a larger trackpad on the Magic Keyboard. Mm, okay. I just try to think of a laptop-like Magic Keyboard, which is what Mark Gurman has reported, and I think one of what's the what's one of the real knocks on the Magic Keyboard is the size of the trackpad. So, and if they made a little it, bit larger, just a little bit. If they made it laptop-like, then maybe it's not going to have that wild cantilever thing. If you don't have to do that, maybe and you give everything right. more space, right? Exactly. Yeah, that would be nice. I would like that. 
My third pick, the iPad Air comes in current iPad Pro sizes. Ah, uh, yes, right. So this is the idea that the iPad Air will be uh, compatible with uh, with the two sizes of iPad Pro. Yep. And we'll use the existing uh, accessories for the current yep. model iPad Pros. So there'll be a, uh, what is it? A an 11 and, and a 12.9. And an 11, yeah. I mean, and that would make sense from that, right? Especially if they're going to move on the Magic Keyboard. Mm-hmm. Maybe they, the old Magic Keyboard will go with this, right? And it's like, great, now you can move that down the line. The the potential issue I see with this pick, they, the iPad Air might be bigger. I don't Could know. be. Could be. Or the, or the story that they're going to do a big iPad Air is not true, as it turns out. Exactly. That's a, that's a possibility. Also possible. But yeah, I think... It could be. I think if they're going to do it, they do it this way. And I do think... Now is the time you could do it if the iPad Pro is going to take a jump. I'm going to say... Hey, just, just for mo- fun, yeah, I okay. think they could yeah. call that product the iPad Air Plus. I hope they oh. don't, but they could. That's just a little funsy, a little tip of the hat. Nice. I'm going to say the base model iPad receives an update. Okay. New base iPad. 11th generation. This feels Yippee! like something you wouldn't pick if it was a video right i just feel like they're going to refresh everything yeah That's but like my, i mean if there was an feeling. event maybe you oh yeah like do they would know? they even mention it well sure they'll mention yeah. it the low cost ipad uh, the, yeah they will but it, and it's probably a minor update from the 10th because the 10th was a big update but there'll be there'll be something and they mm-hmm. may get rid of the ninth we'll see all right my fourth pick bringing us halfway <laughs> The iPad Pro starts at a higher price. <laughs> oh, of interesting. Cases. I do think it will be more expensive. I, d- I don't know if it's going to be from 7 was it 7.99 to to, to 9.50. Yeah, right. Right? That that I could imagine 8.99. I I right. I I think too much higher and it's maybe too much. Oh, I agree. It doesn't mean they'll stop it. I my so here's my thought. I I agree that making them incredibly expensive is is not um is is problematic in some ways. But if they're trying to differentiate the iPad Air from the iPad Pro, and they've got OLED on these devices, and nine ninety nine is right there. That's that's my gut feeling. Is is this would be an opportunity for Apple to kick the iPad Pro way up the product line, started at nine ninety nine, and you know, I, I hope they don't. I right. I hope they. It's seven. But th- yes, th- they honestly. could be introducing the larger iPad Air purely to increase the price of the iPad Pro, mm-hmm. right? But yeah, and and I do think that that's possible. I'm just not sure it's going to go up that high. Like I that's imagine fine. that the the 12.9 inch that that will be that might get a, a bigger bump, but I, I'm not sure could if be. the 11 would. Could be. Although keep in mind that the 12.9 has the fancy backlighting now, and they're both getting OLED. So what does that mean? They're both coming from sort of a different place display-wise? Yeah. I don't know. I don't remember. We had those rumors that they were going to be hugely expensive, and then we had the rumors that said, no, 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 they're it's not like going to be. And I don't know what to think anymore. Per unit. I don't know what to think anymore. Um, okay, I am going to go, again, be the change you want to see in the world. Okay. I am choosing an iPad Pro case is oh offered my. in a color that is not gray, white, or black. My word, Jason Snell. What? <laughs> in my you opinion... Know, they currently sell a smart folio that's blue. It's dark blue, but it's blue. Okay. Marine blue. So I'm holding out hope that they'll be like, and we've got, again, you know, midnight in the forest green, whatever it is. That there's some color, not not saying the Magic Keyboard necessarily, right? Because that's probably not. That's probably going to be boring. Mm -hmm. But that there'll be a case that will not be, for the iPad Pro, that will not be gray, white, or black. So right now there is a case? Yes. One? One. All right. (laughs) Midnight blue. Midnight blue, Mike. Midnight blue. But it's not black. It's blue. You're riding on the fact that they they will have a replacement for this, essentially, right? Like, that's what you're hoping for. Here. Well, I mean, I suppose if they don't change the size of the iPad Pro at all and they use the existing cases, then that would also be true. But I'm I'm thinking they will have to new, do new cases because the shape will be different. And 
they will have their usual, which is like it comes in it, it comes in monochrome and also this one very vaguely colored one. I don't think they're going to do like bright pink, right? Yeah. But that there'll be one that is dark green or dark blue, something like that. All right. This could be an interesting one to school. We'll see how that goes. Mm-hmm. But I wish you the best of luck there because colors are always fun. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by Ladder. Let's be real, people, including me. We have a tendency to put things off until the last minute, whether it's that trip to the DMV, arranging a dental checkup, getting to that hole in the fence. You know the kind of things I'm talking about. While most of the time it works out, the one thing in life you cannot afford to wait on is setting up term coverage life insurance. You may have seen life insurance commercials on TV. You may have heard them on the radio, seen them in newspapers. You're like, I'll get to that later on. But this isn't something you should wait on. Choose life insurance through Ladder today. Ladder is 100% digital. There are no doctors, no needles, no paperwork when you apply for $3 million in coverage or less. You just answer a few questions about your health in an application. They make it so simple to do. Ladder's customers rate them 4.8 out of 5 stars. They got that on Trustpilot. And they made Ford's best life insurance list in 2021. All you need is a few minutes and a phone or a laptop to apply. Ladder's smart algorithms are work in real time, so you're going to find out if you're instantly approved. There are no hidden fees. You can cancel at any time, and you'll get a full refund if you change your mind in the first 30 days. Ladder policies are issued by insurers of long, proven histories of paying claims. They're rated A and A+, by A and Best. And since life insurance costs more as you age, now's the time to cross it off your list. Go to ladderlife.com slash upgrade today, and you'll see if you're instantly approved. That's L-A-D-D-E. ERLife.com slash upgrade. One last time, ladderlife.com slash upgrade. A thanks to Ladder for their support of this show and Relay FM. Okay, round five. Mm-hmm. The Magic Keyboard has a USB C port. Whoo! Wow. Well, the current one does. So. Yeah. Oh well. The, wait a second. No, I did that wrong. Then. Well. Oh, uh, well. Uh, 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 okay. I, I would line Apple this out. Apple already uh, my, my offers man. an iPad Pro case and a collar. So. <laughs> no, but but my my reason to not line this out was that it, it that it works for not charging. It's like with data oh. support. Well, then get rid you, of that. You got, I don't want it. You you're not going to pick it then. Although, okay. No, I don't want it. Although, just saying, and I will say that maybe we could have lined out your iPad Pro case one, considering it's like they already do but it. You but you Nevertheless, we'll let it. I we'll mean, let it fly. I, Honestly, when they do a new one, it is a serious risk that they just go I back know. to monochrome. I know. Right? So I'm going like to go every with time my you're rolling the pick. dice there. My fifth okay. pick right. now is the new Sorry. Magic right. Keyboard has a I, function okay. row. Has a function row. That is a better yeah. pick. Good job. I'm going to go with that pick instead. Okay. Because I'm not taking okay. the data support. <laughs> I'm not taking no. that. <laughs> no, 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 that's no, no, what no, made no. that outlandish, which is why I couldn't believe that you picked it. Okay, function row. I, you know, again, be the change you want to see in the world. It would be so space. Hopefully. I hope so. Like the function row is so useful. And when I use an iPad Pro with external keyboards that have it, it's so great because I can do media control and, and brightness control. And then you get to the Magic Keyboard, which is a product that I love, but like no function row is brutal. So mm-hmm. I hope that that would be like the obvious things, right? This function row and, and trackpad size. Yep. I would think. I would hope. Oh, do I have to pick one now? Oh. It's up to, yes, that that is how oh, it man. goes. That's how it goes. Man, I don't like these at all. Okay, this is vague enough that I'm going to pick it and just hope for the best, which is iPad Pro has a new OS feature that takes advantage of Magic Keyboard. Okay. That's the Something. thing we have. Can we try and talk about what we think that might be just for context? Uh, oh, you know, can I change this pick to be a, a new accessory? I just want to. I want to see if there's a software feature that they introduce, right? That's not in current iPad OS. That yeah. that that a, an accessory is involved with, right? Like a new feature, or or I could take it back to it has a new OS feature. But like I want it. I want it to be like, oh, here's the thing the iPad couldn't do before that it does now, Let's and only the on the iPad Pro. The iPad okay. o- I, All right. The iPad Pro has a new OS feature that takes advantage of a new accessory. Like okay. that's kind of got to be the two things combined. All right. Because then you, it's not super like you know just a new OS feature might be a little too 
uh, broad, right. but like at setting. least this is like maybe there's maybe the pencil does something new, like hover, mm. right? Or right. Maybe it's something. The, the keyboard it's, it's that. Does something it's that. New. There's a reason we're waiting for an OS update for these things, and it's because I'm going to say an accessory that yep. needs a thing to do a magically new thing that we haven't seen before. Yeah. All right. My pick six was that one. Um, ah, ha ha. Finally. I am. Um, I'm doubling down. And I'm going to say the iPad Air webcam is on the horizontal edge. Oh, okay. I'm doubling down. All right. This so you, you believe it's riskier. it's horizontal everywhere. Yeah. I mean, if I, I mean, maybe not on the iPad Mini if it gets updated and all that. But basically, you're like, no, no, this is the time where they're going to the horizontal edge for all the webcams. I mean, they should do it. Webcams. So, and they have done it. So I feel like they should just continue that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. why just ipad you know let's do them all okay um i'm gonna pick more colors are nonsense <laughs> magic keyboard comes color match to ipad pro models i like this one right because so the idea here is that the, the reports are that it's gonna have an aluminum Yes. element to it yes and if you've got if you've got a you know starlight and midnight or a space gray and silver ipad pro presumably they would color match them right because the current ones are in two colors but they're not matched to anything Correct. because there's no material like that on the ipad pro right now but if they have an aluminum element on the keyboard presumably they would want to color match it to the aluminum on the ipad that's the yeah. idea I mean, if they're going to make it out of aluminium, they 100% should do this, right? So I right. would Can like you to imagine them it. selling a space gray model and not having a space gray keyboard? That's weird. I mean, I can't imagine it. I can't imagine it. <laughs> I hope that they don't yeah. do that. But don't do it. So my next pick is one that I feel like when I say it, considering how we've been pretty scrutinous, we might actually remove it. But it was in the list, so I'm going to say it. Okay. The new Apple Pencil charges magnetically. Yeah, well, so th here's the idea here is there are – we have an Apple Pencil now that charges via USB-C. Yeah. One of the, th the theories might be that if they – if it attaches webcam. magnetically, but can they charge it magnetically when they're also moving the webcam? We'll and find so this out. Question of I'm like, going to pick it. Okay. I think that would so be we'll a find serious out. regression. I agree. If they did that. Um, I put in charge via USB-C, and then I thought, well, let's do both sides of this and see what happens. Yeah. Right? Um, you know, yeah. it, there's a thing here for me where it's like, they might be able to just make it work by doing the charging on one side and the webcam on another side. And the way that the keyboard cases and stuff might work would be based on that idea. Yeah, could you be. Know? We'll see. But yeah, I, 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 I can see why they would change it. I would be really surprised if they couldn't have found a way to deal with this. Yeah, I think so. Uh, Magic Keyboard only works with 2024 iPad Pro models. Okay. Just, it's a new keyboard. It only works with a Pro. It's for the Pro. There's going to be something about it. I think it's going to be the attachment because it's going to be more laptop-like and that's going to require very specific iPad hardware that is allow allowing it to do that attachment via magnets or whatever, and it's not going to be backward compatible with any other models of iPad because of that. All right. Eighth pick, final pick. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at my list here. Yeah, I know. My little right. short list. Uh, oh. oh, boy. Um... I have two that I'm really struggling with to mm -hmm. choose from. Mm -hmm. One is one that I think could happen. The other is is something I want to happen. Oh, go with your go with what you want to happen. No, 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 no. That's, get it wrong. that's how you lose a draft. Yeah, uh, no, no. Tell me about <laughs> it. Tell me about it. I'm gonna go with 
All right, I'm going to go with one that splits the difference. It's one that I think should happen and one that I think will happen. The iPad Pro gets MagSafe. Oh, I don't think this will happen. Um, it, now, it's got magnets on the back, but that's not what you're saying here, right? You're saying MagSafe for charging. Yeah, MagSafe for charging. But here's what I'll say, right, about this. Mm-hmm. The, what, the only reason I've picked this, there is there are two types of MagSafe. There are two types of MagSafe. And I don't think it's going to get iPhone MagSafe. Yeah, you think it's going to get Mac MagSafe? Yeah, because iPhone MagSafe to me doesn't make sense. Or a product. new third iPad Max. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know what? There might get, be another you one. It. You get it if if that if that happens. They might say, uh, like you know, like oh, now the keyboard attaches magnetically and charges via MagSafe. <laughs> it's like it's mm-hmm. like a completely different thing. Uh, but there you go. Like you know, you attach the the la, la, the iPad to the keyboard, and the keyboard has the new MagSafe thing. But yeah, I think MagSafe because mm. magnet magnetic charging is good. Apple has yes. two different types of it. At least one of those should come to the iPad. Stop making me plug it in. I agree. I agree. Okay, I'm going to go with my last pick. Uh, I'm going to pick new Apple Pencil has an eraser. Okay. Now. 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 I'm I'm going to leave this open. One of the rumors about the Apple Pencil is that it's going to have swappable tips. If one of the swappable tips is an eraser... I get this pick. That's, if it's yeah. got an eraser on the back side, I get this pick. If it's got a button that you hold down and it, it doesn't turns matter into how. a eraser, I get the pick. If they, but like if there an is eraser, a, a like defined eraser function in the Apple on Pencil, hardware defined by Apple in hardware, yes, you get yes. this pick. And there are multiple ways to do it. And I an I'm eraser. Happy. This is not so. The pick that I was choosing from was the Apple Pencil has at least one button, which is a thing I've been asking for uh, them yes. to do since the first one. Right, an actual button, because I feel like now they might do a solid state button because they've gotten better at that. Right, that's true. Yeah, yeah. As somebody who you know, the current Apple Pencil, um, I never use their like double tap uh, kind of thing because it's, it's, it's not, not very good. It's not very reliable. It's not reliable right. enough. But, but if they could have a a little button or something like that, or and, and the swappable tips and and the reason I picked the eraser also is that I think fundamentally this will be the if it if it exists the fourth Apple Pencil. Yeah. How can you have a thing called pencil and never have an eraser? It's yeah, bananas. It's weird. Especially when, so, like at first, all right, fine, you put the charging thing there. But then you didn't do that, <laughs> you know? Right. And, like, they, and also for people that think, if it's got a button on it, I'm going to be pressing it all the time. Trust me, you won't. I use a Wacom tablet. It has a button exactly where your finger goes. You just don't, you, you just know how to hold it we, in a, from a pressure perspective. Yeah, yeah. The Apple it. will build in a very particular level of resistance. Mm-hmm. And it's not rocket science. And then, and then, it or it's a you physical have to button. Actively press it. Yeah, you know, physical button. They actually, put a little button in there. Yeah. That is the iPad draft. Maybe we'll score it next week. Maybe it's the week after. Maybe it's four months from now. Right? We like just that's don't the know. thing. We've done this. This is for whenever these iPads happen. And I guess yeah. basically the way we'll do this is. It's whenever they have iPad Pros. Should we just use that as the thing? Like, cause yeah, if yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not gonna. What we're not gonna do is partially score the draft yeah. and wait for the iPad Air to come out. This is this <laughs> is dependent on the iPad Pros being released, and we'll, we'll score it whenever that happens. Yes. which hopefully will be within the next couple of weeks. I hope so. Again, if you would like to score along, go to upgrade.cards. There will be a scorecard there from our wonderful friend Zach Knox, who puts those together for us. No Ask Upgrade this week, but if you want to send in your questions for our next episode, go to UpgradeFeedback.com. You can check out Jason's work at SixColors.com. I really recommend going and reading Jason's article in full. It's in the show notes as well about the Department of Justice stuff because there was much more detail there. Uh, it was, it's a really, really good article. Genuinely, like I read it and was like, I don't. I feel like I don't need to read anything else. So thank you so much for doing that work for me, Jason. You took like an hour off my prep today. Great. You can also hear Jason's shows here on Relay FM and at theincomparable.com. You can listen to me here on Relay FM too and check out my work at cortexbrand.com. If you want to find us online, Jason is at J Snell, J S N E L L. I am at I Mike, I M Y K E. Yes, I am trying to shorten this. All right. I've, I've heard your feedback. <laughs> I'm doing my best. Good. You can watch Good. video clips of the show on TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube. We are at Upgrade Relay. Thank you to our members who support us of Upgrade Plus. Go to getupgradeplus.com and you can sign up. Today we're going to talk about all of the things that were on the draft list that we didn't pick. 
thank you to our sponsors, Ladder, Vitally, and Squarespace. But most of all, thank you for listening. We'll be back next week. Until then, say goodbye, Jason Snow. Order in the court. Goodbye, Mike.